All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this event is joint, jointly sponsored by the Duke Forum for Law and Social Change, the Federalist Society, and the Refugee Asylum Support Project here at Duke. Um, today we have two speakers with us to talk about U.S. immigration policies and refugee migration. Uh, the first that will speak today is Stuart Anderson. Um, he's going to speak for about 20 minutes about the history of U.S. immigration policies and how those policies have affected and are affected by past refugee migrations. Um, Stuart Anderson is an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and he's the executive director of the National Foundation for American Policy. Uh, Stuart has extensive background working with immigration issues um, on the Hill and um, other agencies up in Washington, D.C., which he'll tell you a little bit about during his speech. Our second speaker will be Jeffrey Mock, who is going to briefly discuss Amnesty International's Syrian refugee relief efforts and its place within a larger refugee crisis. Mr. Mock is chair of the Middle East Country Specialists for Amnesty International USA. He currently serves as the Egyptian and Syrian country specialist for the organization. Um, at Duke, Mr. Mock it works at the um, office of Duke Today, working with news and communication here. <laughs> Um, with that, uh, and after they both speak, we're going to open it up to questions. Um, so we hope to have a very extensive question and answer time, as this is a town hall and really meant to answer and address your questions and concerns. With that, Mr. Anderson. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. I'm going to talk briefly about some of the, um, the district court and Seventh Circuit um, decisions related to refugees, so you see how that interacts with, um, you know, the headlines and, and the court cases. Uh, and then I'm going to go into some of the history because that rarely gets talked about in our kind of 24-hour news cycle, and it, I think it's good to have some perspective on that. Uh, the big case that recently came out, it was in Indiana, and, um, and there's a district court case where uh, Indiana Governor Mike Pence he directed Indiana state agencies basically to not pay the um, support agencies, the relief agencies who would help refugees uh, to settle in Indiana. And he thought that would be a good way to deter Syrian refugees from coming to Indiana. Um, but there was a, uh, a, a complaint against the governor in the state, and district court ruled that uh, the state's action was preempted by federal law and discriminated against Syrian refugees. And in particular, um, it said that it's clear that Exodus, which was the agency involved, uh, and its refugee clients will be harmed by the state's directive. And uh, because of that, it issued a preliminary injunction. Then what happened was the, the state appealed that to the Seventh, seventh Circuit. And the Seventh Circuit uh, issued a decision and essentially said that, uh, that refugee and immigration policy, it's a federal responsibility. And it also pointed out that under the uh, Refugee Act of, of 1980, that services funded under the section shall be provided to refugees, refugees without regard to race, religion, nationality, sex, or political opinion. Um, and basically what, what the decision said, and I'll quote from it, is that without the injunction, Exodus, if unable to obtain necessary funds from another source, will be unable to provide the essential assistance to refugees. And in some, some parts of it were actually fairly scathing. Uh, as Judge Posner uh, wrote that uh, the Governor Pence argues that his policy of excluding Syrian refugees is based not on nationality, and thus is not discriminatory, but is based solely on the threat he thinks they pose to the safety of residents of Indiana. But that's the equivalent of his saying, uh, not that he does say, that he wants to forbid black people to settle in Indiana, not because they're black, but because he's afraid of them. And since race is therefore not his motive, he isn't discriminating. Um, but that, of course, would be racial discrimination, just as his targeting Syrian refugees is discrimination on the basis of nationality. 
uh, point out that Indiana is free to withdraw from the refugee assistance program, uh, but there would uh, there actually would be other ways for the agencies to get some of the some of the funding if, even if they did that. And in right of, in light of that, the preliminary injunction was affirmed. Now, I would say this, is that given that Mike Pence, Mike Pence is Donald Trump's running mate, I'm sure being defeated in the Seventh Circuit was probably the least embarrassing thing to happen to him this month. So, <laughs> um, so now let's, let's turn to some historical perspective uh, to see how we got to, got to this point. Now, if you think about American history, and you think about the first people who, who, you know, some of the first people who came to this country, obviously um, the, the pilgrims did not have to get a visa to come here. And in, really, in a sense, they were refugees because of their fear of political persecution uh, in England. And really, if you look at U.S. immigration law, um, going from that period up until 1924, um, Essentially, there were no restrictions on immigration into the United States, with the one exception of, in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which obviously was a very discriminatory piece of legislation. But except for that piece of legislation, you could go through the founding period, you can go through War of 1812, the American Civil War, really all the way up until 1921 and 1924, with the one exception I noted, uh, and anyone could come into the United States uh, with, with very minor you know, uh, controls at, at, at ports of entry. Um, and I think it's important to know that many of these people who came in, even though we call them all immigrants, really a, a large number of them I think we would classify today as refugees. Even the people who were coming from Ireland, the famous you know, Irish exodus, uh, I mean, obviously, the you know the immediate uh, th the famine was was a main cause, but even that was connected to to rules on land ownership, and so I think you really need to look at where I mean, you know, to ask yourself where do economic rights and political rights where do they intersect, and you know, I mean, for example, you know, if you're you want to start a business in in some in certain countries, Cuba. Um, certain African countries, you certainly can easily run afoul, afoul of, of, of government authorities. Um, if you look at, in particular, if you look at religious discrimination, you know, many, many of the Jews that came uh, at, the, at the turn of the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century, uh, were escaping things like pogroms in Russia um, and in Poland. Um, and so it's clear that even though they were coming in through what we'd call the immigration system, really in many cases, they, I think you would consider them refugees. Now, 1921, 1924 was very important because it, it culminated in, in very restrictive immigration laws called the National Origins Quotas. In 1921, these, these quotas were temporary and then they were made permanent and even more restrictive in 1924. And they really came out of, of the eugenics movement. Uh, and this idea that people of different skull sizes, and they tried to make it very scientific, but essentially it was just another way to discriminate against people that they didn't, that people didn't want in the country. Uh, in this case, it was it was geared very much uh, against Italians and Greeks, and um, and certainly Jewish uh, Jewish immigrants from from, e from Eastern Europe. Uh, and in fact, I know that the House Judiciary Committee actually had a eugenics consultant on staff. Um, I don't think they still have that position as far as I, as far as I know, uh, but it actually was a real consultant that they had, and this person actually wrote the model uh, sterilization laws that were used in, in many states, uh, even part of the whole uh, Buck v. Bell case, uh, which, by the way, was as late as, I believe, 1927. Uh, so this was certainly the, the view at the time. Now, because of, because of these laws, um, you saw, for example, immigration from Russia drop by about 99% over the course of, of, of between like 1920 and 1930, if you looked at the statistics. And one of the, one of the real impacts that this had is uh, during the rise of fascism in Europe, there really was not a place for people to go. Um, now, obviously, we know that some 
refugee scientists were able to, to come here. And as a result, it was actually very fortunate for the United States that they were admitted because they were really the ones that led the Manhattan Project. In fact, even the idea of the Manhattan Project came from the Jewish refugee scientists uh, um, that, that came here um, to, escape, to escape fascism. But in many cases, people could, literally could not get out, of, get out of their situation in Europe. In fact, one of the most famous uh, people who was not able to come out uh, was Anne Frank and her, and her family. Uh, it, it came to light more recently that uh, Anne Frank's father actually was trying desperately to get a visa to come into the United States. Uh, but he certainly ran up against the obstacles from the State Department and that, that combined with not only the, the strict laws uh, against having people come in, but to any, any leeway that was allowed. Um, the State Department was able to make it as difficult as possible. Uh, back then, we, we didn't have uh, emails being leaked, but we do have like diaries and there's a Breckenridge Long um, you, you know, his, his uh, diaries and some of his other statements that were later came out where he was basically directing council officers to do whatever you can to delay and delay and delay and make it as difficult as possible for any Jewish refugees to ever come into the United States. So that was literally the, the policy of the, of the State Department as, as it was enacted. After World War II, you would think after news of the Holocaust came out, uh, it would have been a much more receptive uh, audience for in the American public and with policymakers to have refugees come into the country. But it really wasn't uh, the way you think it would, you know, the way we think about it today. Uh, there was a, a Displaced Persons Act uh, that passed and allowed about 100,000 refugees to come in after World War II. But it was, act but, um, but uh, different historians have labeled that actually one of the most anti-Semitic uh, piece of legislation they, they've seen in American history. And be because it was written in a way that put dates for when someone was in a refugee camp or a displaced persons camp, so it specifically would exclude uh, Jews to be, able to, to be able to qualify. And so really uh, only about maybe 15% of the refugees who came in to, from that first piece of legislation were actually, were actually Jewish. Uh, one of the senators that was really active in, in this effort was Senator McCarran, who's a Democrat from Nevada. And there's actually a whole book about him called, uh, I think it's called like Washington Gone Crazy. And you know you have to be either really good or really bad to get an entire book written about you as a US senator. And um, I'll let others judge uh, which one he was, but I mean, it's really clear he was really doing everything he could to keep Jewish refugees out. And there was a later piece of legislation that was a little more, uh, a little more open um, and did allow more Jewish refugees to be able to come into the country along with other, uh, along with other displaced persons. If you go ahead there to try to formalize uh, the process more, in 1980, the United States passed the Refugee Act. Obviously, other things were happening in the, in the 50s and 60s, but they tended to be exceptions to the rule when, like, Hungarians and Cubans. Uh, and so the 1980 Act was an effort to make things more formalized. You would have a formal... Uh, process of consultation between the United between the U.S. Congress and the President to set annual refugee numbers. Uh, I actually participated in, in, some, in a number of those where it's kind of neat. You get to go, you go meet the Secretary of State. You talk about you know what what's likely to happen with the the numbers. Um, I really found that in many cases the decision had largely already been made through the appropriations process. So many times you were end up uh, almost lobbying for any changes you wanted for the next the, the next year the next the next uh, time when the admissions process would would come forward obviously this the refugee act 1980 was very important because of um, what was happening with the vietnam war and uh, and it helped facilitate the process for for many uh, refugees from Vietnam and, and Southeast Asia, more generally, to be able to come into come into United States. Um, 
And I also was working in Congress at a time when there was another group of Muslim refugees who were under threat that, that if looking back, it's almost ironic, but they were actually, it was actually very popular to help them. Uh, I remember when I was working in the US Senate, there was the Kosovo crisis and there we had hearings and I knew it was a politically popular cause because we had many US senators who never showed up for any of the hearings all of a sudden show up for these hearings because there were gonna be a lot of TV cameras there. And, um, and so there, as at that time, you know, senators from both sides of the aisle did want to associate themselves with helping these, this particular group of refugees who were essentially almost all, you know, almost all Muslim, or for the most part were Muslim. Um, I would also say that uh, one of the important things to think about and why, why this process, uh, why the, the whole issue of Syrian refugees has become, became so politicized really I think has to do with probably a lack of understanding of the different process between Europe and the United States. In the case of the United States, um, the refugees that we admit formally through, through, the, uh, through the refugee process, um, the first screening really comes from UNHCR, UN agency, um, in which these are people in camps, they're screened by, you know, by the UN agency, um, and you have to pass, you know, to, to get into the United States, it can't just be you're displaced. Um, you have to have a well-founded fear of persecution under the standards under, under the law. Um, after that process goes through, then these people are vetted and, and interviewed by, by U.S. Uh, individuals. Um, and until you get to that point, um, and that it often can take up to two years uh, for that process. Um, now, it is possible, of course, that some, you know, some, you know, terrorist entity could try to infiltrate that process and, and do that. But, you know, knowing the process takes so long and the layers that have to go through, um, it would seem a less likely avenue uh, to have uh, as a way to you know to infiltrate or to come to, to come to the United States, that there would be much, you know, much probably easier ways if someone was really determined uh, to do that than trying to go through through this process. Um, I think Cato Institute did do an analysis of saying you know since there's been refugees, um, they actually said said I I believe the number were where uh, three Americans had ever been killed in, a, in sort of through some sort of terrorist act by refugees. And those actually, I believe, were Cubans back in the, back in the 80s, um, so, or 70s or 80s. So, so I think they said the odds of American getting killed by refugee, at least based on their most recent history, was something like one in like three or four billion. So, um, so again, it was not, it's not to make light of it, but it's to say, you know, this is put some analysis uh, behind it. So that's sort of the U.S. process in which you have, you know, again, it can take one to two years, uh, have different agencies, and mostly, in many cases, it's focused on families, uh, particularly women and children. I think in many cases, you're looking at maybe two-thirds women, women and children. Um, the, what, what happened in Europe with, with this, you know, you know, number of people that were, were coming across, and in many cases, and I think actually even one of the people who was involved in the Paris, in the Paris bombing, you know, had just showed up on a, on a Greek island and, and was admitted, was really essentially no process. They really weren't refugees, they were really migrants that were pretty much allowed in. I mean, the, the level of scrutiny was probably less, or was probably only slightly more, say, than, you know, entering this building. For example, I mean that there was really almost no screening in many cases. Uh, if someone had some sort of documents, it was record it was recorded, and the person you know was allowed in. Now I think that that's probably improved since that time. But during the initial rush uh, of people that were coming in, people were literally just kind of recorded and let in, you know, let into Europe. And in that situation, it obviously would be very easy for terrorist organizations to be able to be involved in that type of, you know, to be able to do that, what people would be concerned about, you know, in terms of a security threat. Um, 
So I would say that's really the important distinction. And I think it goes back to what the court's ruling was with, you know, in terms of the, you know, not just the law, but even the, the, the threat um, that, you know, that you could perceive um, based on the differences in how, how refugees are screened in the United States versus what was happening in Europe. I would close on a personal note. Uh, I actually have some experience personally with, uh, with the refugee process because when I was uh, studying uh, Russian language, I was in the, what used to be called the Soviet Union, and I, had, I was outside a um, rock concert and had a Russian friend who asked me how, the, how I liked the music, and I was polite, and I said, oh, I thought it was good. He said, oh, no, it was bad. You know, our, our, our groups are bad, you know, you know. And so we became good friends after that. And some, you know, I went on some other trips, and we stayed in touch. And at some point, because he was Jewish, he was finding a very difficult time um, in the Soviet Union for him and his, for him and his family. So he had applied uh, for, as a refugee and actually had, had made it to a certain point but needed a way you know, someone to kind of basically sponsor him. So I was able to sponsor him so him and his family could actually come um, and they actually stayed with me for a little bit in New Jersey. And then I saw the process in hand, what great work the refugee uh, agencies do. There's a group, a HIAS, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, where they you know, were able to help him find an apartment and job you know, and, and work on, um, you know, job hunting and things like that. Although he's, he's actually done very well. He had a, you know, son, you know, young son at the time coming in. And, and my friend is actually a sculptor and he's um, even an entrepreneur now. He has this, like a small music label and, uh, and um, it's like Russian psychedelic uh, music, if anyone's interested in that. I don't know if that's popular today, but uh, he has a niche in the marketplace, I think. Um, and I would say that this uh, this eight year old Russian boy um, that you know came in uh, you know with with my friend his son uh, you know a few years later he was just like any other American kid except he was really good at math okay that was the difference but well and I uh, ended there and we'll hear uh, more about the world more broadly on refugees. More about Russian psychedelics. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Jeffrey Mock. Uh, I've worked here at Duke for 30 years, but uh, I also, have, for a similar time, been working on Syria for Amnesty International. Um, the premise of what I'm going to say right now is that the world's leadership has failed completely on this refugee crisis. And what Stuart talks about has been very helpful to give the context for that, because we are facing the greatest global crisis, refugee crisis since World War II, just in terms of numbers and percentage of people. It's so like 0.4 percent of all humans are now refugees or internally displaced people. 0.4 may not seem like a lot, but that's a historically high level. Um, you may not have known or heard about this, but two weeks ago, the world's leaders met in New York to talk about the refugee crisis, and if you didn't hear about it, it's because every statement and every policy that came out of it was tepid and ineffective. Um, and this is just a building upon a series after series of tepid and ineffective actions on the refugee crisis. And there have been significant consequences for this. One of which is that the neighboring countries of all the refugee crisis, and I'm going to focus on Syria, but the neighboring countries are fed up. They believe they've taken on as, men, as much as they have, and they make a good argument that they've taken on as much as they can. And they are now in violations of international refugee covenants, but understandably, under the political circumstances, they're shutting borders. As I speak, there are now 75,000 Syrians on the border with, German, uh, with Jordan in the desert. Food is running out disease is rife, people are 
dying from preventable illness simply because they are not allowed into Jordan, and authorities have blocked aid, access for aid. All humanitarian aid coming from Jordan is not being allowed in. It's certainly not coming from within Syria. Medical treatment and any meaningful humanitarian response has been blocked. These people are suffering deeply. And we, Amnesty International is very critical of Jordan for doing this, but we need to point out that if I list the top 10 countries that are for taking refugees, we have Turkey with 2.5 million, Lebanon, uh, Jordan with 2.7 million is actually topping the list, Pakistan 1.6, Iran 1 million, Lebanon 1.5 million, and then the other five are countries in Africa, Chad, the Congo, Uganda, Kenya, and Ethiopia. So these are the countries that are stepping up and actually doing something about the refugee crisis which is more than what the wealthy countries are doing. These country, 10 countries, which account for less than 2.5% of the world's GDP, are taking in 56% of the world's refugees. Um, and this is, so this is not sustainable. What is ha so the first cause is those countries that have stepped up to take uh, on the refugee crisis are now drawing back. I mentioned Jordan. A second example is Turkey. The EU just made an agreement with Turkey where they would start sending back Syrians that came to Greece to Tur back to Turkey. Amnesty International's position is that this deal, the assumption of this deal is that Turkey is a safe place for asylum seekers and refugees for which they can be returned. But that is a fallacy. It's a fiction. These Turkey, uh, the, the refugees that are in Turkey are prevented from working. They, are, um, they face legal risk. They face risk of return. Um, so this, this is just not some, this, this is just one way the European countries, the EU, are using to resolve the crisis without actually resolving it. It's putting the, the, the Syrians back at risk. So the, th the th second a result of the failure of the, the, the world to step forward is exactly what Stuart was talking about. It's the hundreds of thousands of people making the dangerous trip across the Mediterranean to Europe. And he is right. There is no vetting going on there, very little vetting that's going on there. It is dangerous for the refugees, it's dangerous for the host country that receives them, and it, it is not... The, um, it is not the way we want this process to be worked for, through. The good news is there is another option. It's called legal resettlement. It's done through the UNHCR, and he went. Stuart talked about the process. You're hearing a lot about extreme vetting. I'm telling you right now, extreme vetting already exists, and it exists through the UN. And the UN has stated that resettlement is important um, because of all the refugees. There are now 5 million Syrian refugees in the neighboring countries. And as I pointed out, this is not sustainable. It's actually going to threaten the political stability of the con host countries. Uh, like one in four people in Lebanon now is a Syrian refugee. That's just not something that leads, can have a long-term, be a long-term solution. The UN says, okay, let's settle just 10% of these 5 million people. They're actually asking for around 470,000. Just 10%, leave 90,000, 90%. But if we leave 10% in wealthier countries, resettle them, then these camps will be able to provide the education, 
the food that um, that uh, can keep the camp, allow the refugees to remain short term in the camps, and hopefully a political solution will create be occur down the road in Syria that they can go back. But even this minimum goal of 10 percent, the world is falling fantastically short. You may have heard that the U.S. just met the goals set by President Obama of resettling 10,000 Syrian refugees. I'm not sure how they did it, because by July, they only had like 3,000. There was just this great rush over the last few months. But that's a positive note that we have stepped forward. The U.S. has finally stepped forward and taken in 10,000. That brings us to around 12,000 resettled Syrian refugees since the beginning of the conflict in 2011. I got to tell you, that number does nothing to make a dent in this UN goal of 470,000. So it's good news that we hit President Obama's goal, but it's bad news, and that goal, that goal was set tragically low. But it's also typical of what the um, what uh, the world leadership has stepped forward in, and uh, and. We're going to need to set higher goals, or the result will be next spring, those people are going to give up on resettlement, the, the refugees are going to give up on resettlement, and for the third year in a row, you're going to see flotillas going across the Mediterranean. They will take it into their own hands because they can't stay. Life in a lot of these camps is just that desperate. Um, so, what is Amnesty International doing? We are, uh, our work on Syria is focusing on resettlement, and we're focusing uh, the European sections. We are an international movement. The European sections are focusing on European countries. We are focusing on the U.S., and we are not asking the U.S. to share the burden itself. I will note that when the U.N. declares a refugee, um, a crisis, the U.S. in past circumstances, such as Kosovo, has stepped up and taken nearly 50 percent of the goals that the U.N. has set. We are asking only for 100,000, the U.S. to take 100,000. The 10,000 doesn't get us that close, but it is a start. Um, the refugee, and I just want to re reference that once the UN gets through the vetting process, that's when Homeland Security, the US comes in and they do their own vetting process. So it's a twofold step. And that's why it often takes two years. Frankly, I've known a number of cases right now of, uh, that have gone into th a third year. People who are in real need of being resettled because their lives are at risk in the camps. So. Again, that just emphasizes that we have this option between this orderly, secure process of resettlement that is through legal processes, and then we have this disorderly, hazardous to the refugee, and low security for the host country process of people just swarming over the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the Mediterranean. The, an the, the answer to the latter is the former, more resettlement. So Amnesty International has just launched, just last week, a global refugee campaign under the hashtag of I welcome. Syria is just one part of it, and I can really only speak to the Syrian process. But what we are asking for nationally is to increase the number of resettlement spaces, and secondly, to ensuring the most vulnerable people are the ones that get priority in resettlement. We have in the refugee camps a lot of children who have one or no parents. We have families whose whose uh, are at are, they're being threatened by ISIS, other armed groups, by the Assad regime that we want to make sure that they get resettled priority. 
We want to also open up more safe and legal routes for refugees. I want to be clear, this does not mean open borders. This does mean let's come up with a process that, that does not put refugees' lives at risk and allows the host country to process them in a way that maintains security for the host country but also uh, some respectability and hope for the refugee. And we need to develop a mechanism in which the wealthy countries share responsibility better um, with the host countries that have taken on all the board burden. Now, here in the US, I'll just close up. One of the things, we are a grassroots group we found that working in D.C. was not being very effective to change policies, so that we took a deep breath and stepped back and said, let's start from the bottom up. We have a Syrian refugee toolkit that's online, and if you're interested, I can share it with you, um, to give pointers of how, what individuals can do in their own community. The idea is to have the grassroots work of amnesty change the narrative that's happening at the national level and working its way up. That means creating partnerships with the refugee organizations that are handling the refugees. It means working with city councils to um, get resolutions passed saying we will welcome refugees and Syrian refugees specifically. I'm glad, to, proud to say both Carborough and Durham are two of the city councils that have approved such resolutions. Resolutions that have also been passed in Burlington, Kalamazoo, Philadelphia just last week. They're before, up forward in Berkeley, a couple places in Virginia. And this is one of the things that uh, we, we, I think we are being successful in seeing at the national level greater recognition that the narrative of refugees being Trojan horses for security risk is a phony one and that uh, we, we, we can open the borders. We have a responsibility to open our borders more to these refugees. But um, the other thing that we're doing, and what you as law students, if you're interested in getting involved in, is beyond just the normal amnesty work. Sometimes what the groups do when they go to the local communities and they talk with the refugee organizations and they ask, what can we do? And they expect to say, well, they hear the answer, well, you can sign out, uh, pass out petitions, you can write letters to the editor, and you, you can do that. But fundamentally, there are refugees in all of our communities that need help in the transition. And sometimes they need legal help. But more often, the answers that Amnesty members are getting is they need someone to help them figure out, how do I shop at Costco? You know, How do I work my children through uh, an educational system that is not set up to, um, to handle large numbers of refugees, and in fact, often are fundamentally uh, racist. Um, and so we having amnesty members who are going, meeting with the refugees themselves, and this is something different for the organization, but this is something that if you're interested in getting, uh, doing work, that is probably the answer you're going to get. Help them go to PTA meetings. Help them, you know, help them help their own children doing homework. Little one-on-one -on -one stuff that just is challenging in that transition. So I would hope that if you are interested in the refugee issues, that uh, you will uh, step forward and, and see if you can find some time. I'm sure there's some of the clinics that are already doing this here at the School of Law. Um, but I'm just going to end there. It's a much bigger issue, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Go ahead, Matt. Hi, thank you for coming.
Um, so I was wondering if you can talk about um, the authority that state governments have to, um, I guess, keep refugees from coming in. Because I know after the Paris and San Bernardino attacks, then many state governors were speaking, you know, saying like anti-refugee um, statements and saying that they weren't going to allow refugees in their states. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I mean, essentially, these have been more, I think, in many ways, political statements. Uh, because after the Paris attacks, it was felt, you know, I need to do something to show that I'm concerned uh, about, you know, any threats to my state. <clears throat> From a legal stance, um, it really doesn't seem that governors do have the authority to prevent a refugee from coming into their state. I mean, once they're admitted, uh, you can't sort of prevent someone from moving within, you know, within the borders of the United States. Um, the case, you know, the seven, you know, you know, I encourage people to look, uh, you know, look online, the, the Seventh Circuit uh, decision and the district court before that has quite a bit of information uh, about the legal background uh, and what's allowed uh, for a state to do. Uh, essentially, they can... <coughs> They can opt out of being in the refugee program, um, but it looks like there are other federal authorities that could still be used for funding purposes. So the refugees would still be able to go into those states. Uh, I believe the next kind of legal case could end up being involving the state of Texas, which the governor's uh, has made some statements about. I'll just add that uh, North Carolina's governor, Patrick McCrory, is one of the, the governors who said that we would not accept Syrian refugees. They've come. They're here. And so, um, Ian. I mean, the questions could be broader, too, on immigration. Yeah. Yes, that's, yeah. Go ahead, you're, you're, and then Dave. Uh, Amnesty International, you said, uh, suggests that the United States should take in 100,000 refugees. Um, would the president have the power to do that unilaterally to uh, accept as many as he would want, or uh, is that something that would re require congressional approval? And um, if that were approved, um, what would be like a reasonable time period for that, mm -hmm. that would take place? If Ah, uh, yeah, that's, um, the, the first answer is he, he's the one that set the 10,000. That does not go through congressional approval. Is, that's Well, basically, right, there's a consultation process. Um, I mean, for the next year, it's actually 110,000 mm -hmm. for total refugees, refugees, though. It's sometimes been, for folks, you know, who sort of the internet talk would be, oh, 110,000 Syrian refugees. But actually, if you look up online, you can go to the State Department website. The Bureau of Refugee Affairs um, has a, um, you know, has a breakdown of, and I believe it's going to be 40,000 of the 110,000 would come from the region the Syrians are in in 2017. And so within that 40,000, it wasn't clear exactly how many Syrians would come in, but it's going to be an increase. I mean, Donald Trump has talked about it'll be a 550% increase, but it's coming, you know, I don't know if it'll be actually that high an increase, but, you know, if it goes from 10,000 to 40,000, I guess it'll be a 400%, you know, mm -hmm. increase. Uh, but, you know, so the, but the bottom line is that, the president does have some authority to declare an emergency, uh, but if you're going through the normal process, um, it really actually conforms with the appropriations process in terms of you could admit people, but if you don't have the funds, then you aren't gonna, you're going to have issues with HHS in terms of being able to resettle. So that's why I was mentioning when we went through the annual refugee consultation process, uh, it was, you know, kind of... It was very interesting. You talk about big issues, but I always felt that the numbers had pretty much been decided through the appropriation process that had already taken place. Um, that, that number of 100,000 was actually come up with by a coalition called the Refugee Council USA that Amnesty signed on to. So it's not just Amnesty on that. Um, I think the timetable that we were talking about was over five years. 
Uh, the trick is, and what I didn't say is that while the UN has asked for 470,000 to be resettled, they themselves has, have only identified around a quarter of a million individuals. And what you should take away from that is just how seriously and how long their vetting process is, because they're still going through to identify after all, you know, five years of conflict to identify Syrians for resettlement. On the other hand, we know, I know of Syrians um, who, who were identified two years ago and ready for, uh, for resettlement in the US and they're still in the Turkish camps. Um, and actually to speak to the numbers, we are still have Iraqis that longer than two years ago uh, were identified as for being resettled in the U.S. that still haven't made it over here. So there, there will, we will be taking in uh, refugees from a number of countries in that uh, next year from the region. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned the countries taking in most of the refugees right now are places like Jordan, Turkey, a couple mm -hmm. African nations. Do those countries have ways to kind of incentivize or pressure places like the United States or Canada or, or wealthier countries much further away to kind of um, to incentivize them to take refugees and step up? Or is it heavy forces within those countries that, that kind of bring about that change? Policy. Well, one of the things they do is by just making sure that they get go to the Mediterranean. I mean, seriously, they let them go on the Mediterranean and say, you're not going to help us. You know, they're going to come. Um, I'm sure this is a process that, the, I mean, that was what the UN meeting was. It was basically the host country saying, you have to step up. Um, but it, the politics of it gets very complicated. Uh, there's obviously a lot going on in Syria right now. And when Turkey's talking to the U.S., I'm sure that the refugee issue is number four on that list. Right. Well, I would say you're correct you, that what's happening is, is, you know, what you alluded to in your question is there's been the kind of negotiations between Turkey and the EU and this whole issue of, of uh, Turkey taking back people um, as, a, as a disincentive to people coming through in these sort of extra legal means of, of entering um, EU countries. And, uh, and I think in, there's literally even been straight checks being written, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, you know, in terms of you know, money being sent. Um, as part of that process, and then other sort of political issues related to, you know, Turkey's, um, the relationship between Turkey and the EU. Um, I think it's for unfortunate overall that, you know, Angela Merkel had sort of, you know, positive inclinations, um, but I think, I think the mistake was really not setting up any reasonable process um, and, um, and, you know, and because of that, you end up, you know, you can have good intentions, but if you don't, you know, set up things and organize things in the right way, you can end up with, you know, with bad outcomes. And I think that that's one of the things that, you know, that's happened is that, is that they really, this, this happened, you know, in a very unexpected way. And um, they made quick decisions, and they didn't necessarily make well thought out decisions in terms of how everything would work. Um, I had a question about the UN vetting process. Uh, now, of course, a lot of these people are coming from Syria, where they have bit, maybe basic identification documents. A lot of their records, for instance, like criminal records, would probably not be visible to uh, whoever's doing the vetting. Um, so, could you elaborate a little bit more on that process and like why it can be trusted? Um, I'll start. You jump in where I'm wrong. <laughs> um, uh, it, the vetting process, uh, first of all, the, the, the people, the vetting process goes for mostly for people who are being resettled. And I don't have the list here, but the priorities for um, folks that are getting resettled are uh, disabled people, people at risk, um, uh, children without adults, uh, uh, so they're, they, they, they usually, they're, they don't meet 
the, um, the, the, the standard demographic of security risks. Um, they are literally the most vulnerable people. That being said, you're absolutely right. Very, it's really hard for them to bring documentation. A lot of these people were fleeing their houses while the houses were getting bombed or being, uh, and you know, you, you don't have time to run to the bank and grab your, uh, you know, birth certificate or anything. So that is a that's one of the reasons why it goes so long. Um, but I just know that they do do their best on a criminal check. Um, they do have some access, and they are in communication with Syrian government, but they also are not giving names of the Syrian refugees to the Syrian government. So there, it, it's, it, I, it's, a, it's a long process for a reason. Uh, then it, uh, home, uh, Homeland Security goes through the whole thing as well. Uh, the, the only thing that I can say is that it works better for the people who are getting resettled than for the people who are outside of this process. And, th and those are the ones that are showing up in Greece. Right. And I would also say that in addition to the population being focused more on, you know, in many cases, women and children, um, much less so, I think, it's sort of a, an unattached adult who would be more the profile of, of, you know, someone that would probably be, you know, more fit into the, con the, the concern. Um, Homeland Security, in addition to the security issues, you also have to be able to pass, you know, again, a test of well-founded fear of persecution. You have interviewers who do this a lot. You have to, you can't just be, my house got blown up. You know, it has to be, you know, I was targeted, my community was targeted because of our, you know, ethnic background or religious affiliation. Um, and, you know, you have to have, I mean, to the extent that you can have evidence that supports it, makes it much more likely that you're able to get approved. It's, it's not necessarily just you said it and you have nothing to back you because, in, you know, to the extent that someone does have evidence, they're much more likely um, to be approved. So I, that's sort of the other, you know, the other part of the screening. And, and again, because of the time and the layers and the population of who ends up getting selected, um, again, I wouldn't think it would be the, the best way to, you know, to do something bad to another, you know, to another country. Uh, whereas what was happening in Europe was pretty much, you know, almost anyone could come in. And, and at best, they were getting re they were getting recorded as, as having entered. So I just think it's a much different situation. See, like when has that happened before? Like, what's an example? Especially considering the current situation, it's like this is not like an emergency situation. Well, I think it's happened with with Haitians and Cubans in the in the past, um, and uh, and sometimes those authorities are used. Um, not necessarily completely as a pro-refugee way of, of of doing of dealing with it. It could also be used as a way to be, you know, for interdiction and, and things like that as well. Um, so those are usually it's some some something that's happened. I mean, the United States is very fortunate in that I know we've heard a lot in this election campaign about Mexico and and all this, but I mean, for the most part, you know, we we've you know, the United States enjoys stable borders. I mean. I mean, except for Southport episodes, we don't have much problem, many problems with Canada, you know, uh, for example. Whereas many other, you know, many other countries look at what you know, look what they have at their at their borders. Um, so, you know, so in that respect, we we haven't had to deal with those situations in the same way. One last question, I think. Oh, do we have more? We we can keep going. I think. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sure. My question relates to extraterritorial processing. So this is not just for the U.S., but for all the other countries right now. Um, and I'm talking specifically about agreements, maybe between the neighboring countries of Syria and also northern African countries and European countries where they would um, 
allow the processing and vetting of refugees to take place outside of their borders. Uh, what is your position just on, one, how long do you think uh, these processing plans will continue, and do you think they'll grow in popularity, and do you see any security issues or benefits from those um, I will say we, we don't take a position on those agreements except for when we see those agreements as leading to human rights abuses, as we are concerned about with the EU-Turkey agreement. Um, we don't have a period of time that we think you have to process it within this uh, within this time limit. We understand that this can be challenging. but. Um, if these agreements lead to a more orderly uh, resettlement of individuals, that is something that we would support. It's not the only way of doing it, but um, uh, yeah, we're, we're just going to take a stand on it when we see these processes leading to human rights violations. <laughs> What happens to the people who aren't approved through the vetting process? They remain in the refugee camps. No appeals process. There's. Um, I mean, I don't think that that would. Yeah. Uh, I've not heard of that uh, an appeals process. They because they have so many that are that they're processing. They, they yeah. the U.S. vetting process, would you get to be resettled in a different country, or you're just out? I don't know of an example of that, but uh, I would think the answer would be yes, that you could uh, be, uh, you could, I mean, if the U.N.'s approved you, mm -hmm. they are not approving you for a specific country. They're recommending a particular country, but they're not saying you will go only here. Um, so I would presume that option w would would still be open for other countries. But if the UN turns you down, you're not you're not going to get on that list. Alrighty, well, thank you everyone for coming. Let's give one more round of applause. For